thoughts and opinions on COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you for the yeah, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us. Uh, I will okay. introduce Dr. Ajit Kaushal, uh, who will be taking over the session and who will be the faculty coordinator for this particular uh, lecture. Okay. Dr. Thank Ajit Kaushal, are you here? Dr. Ajit Kaushal, are you here? Great. Dr. Ajit Kaushal, so I would uh, request you to introduce Dr. Radha Krishnan to the audience and the participants, and we may continue further. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, good evening, one and all. On behalf of the Gautia University, I, Dr. Ajit Kaushal, welcome you. And we all know this is the second day of the conference and we are having the opportunity to hear the opinions of some very noted experts from the world over about the current prevailing situation due to the spread of novel coronavirus. So in this continuum, now we have Dr. Radha Krishnan, the principal scientist at SIR Biotech, Washington, D.C., Health Policy Research Specialist Consultant, Maryland State Department of Health, United States. Regarding Dr. Radha Krishnan, Dr. Radha Krishnan has over 18 years of experience as a research scientist and he has extensively worked upon in the field of biomedical, animal science and animal health. His area of expertise includes veterinary science, animal husbandry, animal reproduction and public health. Time to time he has also been giving the valuable consultation to various government and non-government organizations on policy issue addressing two noses and public health. I would like to convey my thanks to Dr. Radha Krishnan on behalf of Galgotia University that he consented to be the speaker in this session. Thank you so much, sir. Before I invite the honorable, honorable speaker, a gentle reminder regarding the few important matters. The participants are requested to keep their tool mute and those who have the questions may send their questions in the chat box. They will take it once the distinguished speaker is finished in this session. So your question will be taken up at the end of the session. So now may I kindly request Dr. Radha Krishnan to share his thoughts on the topic we are taking in this session. Animals to human transmission risk potential, animal careers of coronavirus. Over to Dr. Radha Krishnan. Thank you, Dr. Ajit Kaushal, for your kind introduction. Welcome, sir. We yeah, are sharing my screen. Okay. Yes. So I hope you are able to see the uh, screen that I shared. Not yet. Uh, we can see you, but not the screen yet. Uh, yeah. There you go. So is it visible now? Yes, yeah, your screen is coming. Okay. Sir. okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Radha Krishnan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers of this international virtual summit at uh, Galgotias University, especially Dr. Sweta Pasquality for, for the opportunity. I see this summit has covered various aspects of the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19, the disease it causes. I'd like to give a glimpse of animals as carriers of the novel coronavirus and uh, its relevance to animals to human transmission risk potentials. We know this pathogen came from animals like many other coronavirus and the intermediate host from which the virus jumped to humans to start this pandemic is still being debated. 
So, but before that, I'll, I'd like to talk more about zoonosis, since I believe this understanding by researchers and faculties other than biological sciences may help contribute to containing the current pandemic as well as in uh, prevention of future pandemics. So a little over 100 years after the deadliest pandemic in human history, that is the 1918 Spanish flu, which caused an estimated 50 million deaths worldwide. The world has come to a standstill with mounting deaths by the current coronavirus pandemic. By the way, the death toll from that uh, Spanish flu is equivalent to 200 million in present terms. Though there has been considerable research on coronaviruses, the novel coronavirus has caught the world off guard and uh, its mode of spread, contagiousness, virulence, pathogenesis, and mortality. Everything was unknown and is being learned as it has evolved. So the volume of research on the novel coronavirus needs to be disseminated and shared at the same pace with which it is conducted. In this regard, kudos to the organizers of this uh, international virtual summit as well. So the current pandemic and the global health crisis of unimaginable magnitude is a stark reminder, yet again, of the danger of zoonosis. There have been several pandemics and non-pandemic outbreaks of diseases, and some of them have been epidemics in the recent past that have had zoonotic origin. As you know, zoonosis is the ability of pathogens, including bacteria and viruses, to enter the human population from an animal host. We have recently seen many such emerging zoonoses, including HIV AIDS, SARS, the, uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, MERS, which is uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and the Ebola. All of these were of zoonotic origin. As to HIV, it emerged from primates. The origin of Ebola remains uncertain, but in uh, 2014 to 2016, the virus spread explosively in West Africa. Viruses of the wild waterfowl became poultry adopted influenza viruses. So the avian influenza or simply the bird flu with fatal human spillover cases were caused by viruses of avian origin, <clears throat> such as H5N1 and H7N9. Other non-pandemic diseases of zoonotic origins are the you know, Argentine and Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, the Nipah virus of uh, swine origin, pig origin, human monkeypox, mosquito-borne illnesses such as the chikungunya and uh, Zika viruses. So we'll talk about the SARS and MERS a bit later. Since 1940, scientists have identified about 400 emerging diseases. And it may be surprising to note that more than 60% of them have, you know, have been zoonotic. So this is uh, so significant to note. Roughly 80% of the viruses that infect human beings are zoonotic. Similarly, 50% of bacteria, 40% of fung fungi, 70% of protozoa, 95% of helmets that infect human beings are zoonotic. Most of the identified reservoirs, that is about 80% of them, are mammalian and to a less, lesser extent, avian, that is birds, as in avian influenza and such. There is a proverbial statement that I like, you know, life on earth exists in a thick microbial soup. Survival typically requires collaboration with symbiotic organisms, for example, you know, the gut bacteria in humans, and the forbearance of potentially lethal pathogens. As we saw earlier, the viruses 
or the pathogens that have been causing the majority of zoonotic diseases and they can mutate fast. Uh, for example, if you look at the uh, genome of the human species, it took 8 million years to evolve by 1%. But it's fascinating to know that the animal RNA viruses can evolve by more than 1% in just a matter of days. So the high mutation rates have for millions of years provided opportunities to switch to new hosts in new ecosystems. We'll discuss about how the change in the ecosystems have contributed to the evolution of pandemics. So the changes in the land use, you know, agriculture, mining, etc., play a huge role in creating opportunities for these viral jumps from animals to human beings. Also, these wild animal markets and uh, the live animal markets contribute uh, you know, to also. The phenomenon of zoonosis has been happening among human beings and animals they encounter for you know, thousands of years. But, but the modern world, as we understand, has facilitated zoonotic epidemics to occur in increased frequencies. We have created a global human-dominated ecosystem that has come to serve as a congenial environment for this type of zoonotic emergence and host switching of animal viruses, especially genetically error-prone RNA viruses, as we saw earlier. It is not difficult to understand why we increasingly see the emergence of zoonotic viruses. You know, it's a matter of numbers and geography. More people are coming into contact with more animals in more places, including habitats rarely or even never visited by human beings. For example, you know, the bat caves deep within a forest. So the next slide shows the three stages of zoonosis. In stage one, the encroachment in the wild, wildlife habitat, you know, the putative pandemic pathogens are still in the natural reservoir. So the drivers that cause stage one emergence tend to be large scale environmental, agricultural, or demographic shift. For example, you know, moving of livestock to a region for the first time, or transportation of wildlife from a region for food. Take for, for example, the Nipah virus in Malaysia in 19, uh, 1997, that is the pig farms and fruit orchards frequently visited by the fruit bats. These bats begin to feed on the fruit trees around the pig styes, enabling viral transmission to pigs and thus leading to the stage one emergence. Stage two is a localized emergence as you see. The initial spillover of wildlife or livestock pathogen to people. Causes range from handling of butchered wildlife to exposure to formats to in wildlife markets or livestock farms and so forth. And the stage three is the pandemic emergence, sustained person-to-person -person transmission and large scale spread often aided by global air travel. You know, as we saw it in HIV AIDS and the SARS, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome and now the COVID-19. Let's look at the uh, uh, modes of spread after the pathogen makes the initial jump from the animal carrier uh, to humans. The pathogen spread from bats to infect animals sold in live animal markets, allowing direct viral access to crowds of humans. This increases opportunities exponentially for host switching. Ebola virus was spread across Africa by truck routes and sexual transmission. The arena virus viruses causing Argentine and Bolivian hemorrhagic fever mentioned earlier are associated with agricultural practices. The Bolivian hemorrhagic fever was spread across Bolivia by road building that fostered migration of uh, reservoir roads. Uh, I'm sorry, reservoir uh, rodents, that is. In uh, Southeast Asia, the Nipah viruses emerged from bats because of the intensification of pig farming as we just uh, 
you know, so in a bat-rich biodiversity hotspot. The human monkeypox emerged in the United States because of a booming international wildlife uh, trade. In 1980s, the 80s uh, albopictus mosquitoes were being spread globally by humans. In 2014 and 2015, we had pandemics of the aedes born chicken gunia and uh, Zika viruses. So once a virus jumps into humans, population density you know, uh, becomes a factor in turning what might potentially be a smaller eruption illness into an epidemic. And of course, the uh, global trade is a force multiplier for viruses. And an epidemic quickly turns into a pandemic as we've seen in the current situation. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so in 2003, SARS outbreak began with virus transmission between bats and uh, civet cats, which then passed the virus onto the humans. Similarly, the intermediate host during the 2012 MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome outbreak, is believed to have been dromedary kennels. The novel coronavirus and the SARS viruses are very similar genetically and both are found in bats. You know, Dr. Stanley Perlman, a virologist at the U University of Iowa, who is part of the coronavirus study group, a subset of the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, mentioned that you know, these two viruses, the novel coronavirus and the SARS virus, likely had a common ancestor in the bat population. So as you see, there have been several coronavirus zoonoses that have occurred in the past. Coronaviruses affecting human health belong to the family of coronaviridae and the subfamily coronavirinae. Among the four genera included in this subfamily, only the alpha coronavirus and the beta coronavirus are of interest for human and the clinical virologists. So when I see this pattern of evolution, it seems to me that the virulence has kept increasing. The novel coronavirus is, is astoundingly bad in all aspects. For example, when it comes to shedding of the virus, the novel coronavirus is about a thousand times more than the SARS virus, according to a recent uh, German research study. This parameter alone perhaps accounts for the fact as to how easy the novel coronavirus spreads from person to person as well as maybe through you know, surfaces. So um, we've seen this diagram many times, the novel coronavirus. It was proposed that this virus came from bats, which had 99% match between the genome of the virus they carry and the ones found in humans. The coronavirus is similar to two viruses that circulate in bats, but bats were thought to be not the direct a source or it's not directly responsible for infecting humans. So the general consensus is that the virus might have skipped through another species before infecting humans. Bats, or if you're wondering, you know, are the second most common mammal after rodents, making up nearly 20% of all species of mammals. There are more than 13,000 species of bats, and some of them can live up to 40 years. And the bats have a unique immune system that allows it to harbor so many viruses. Excuse me. Okay, uh, so during the first week of February this year, a group of Chinese researchers, Tommy Lam and co-workers, announced that the novel coronavirus, the pathogen that causes COVID-19, jumped from the scaly ant-eating pangolins, as you see in this picture. So this pangolins are an endangered, highly trafficked creature that looks like a cross between the, an anteater and an armadillo. Its scales are priced in traditional Chinese medicine, although they are made of keratin, just like you know fingernails. It is the most illegally traded animal in the world for its use in the traditional Chinese medicine. So the researchers have noted that a coronavirus previously identified in pangolins is more closely related to the novel coronavirus that 
than any virus identified so far. But there is a caveat. The authors, <coughs> excuse me, the authors also mentioned that there might be another intermediate host before the virus passed onto the humans. So the RNA genome of the novel coronavirus has about 29,000 nucleotides encoding 29 proteins. So here you uh, see the structure of the receptor binding domain or RBD for short of the novel coronavirus. So the RBD is a crucial part of the coronavirus which allows them to latch onto and enter a cell. So five studies have shown that coronaviruses in frozen cell samples from the illegally trafficked pangolins showed between about 85.5% and 92.4% of their DNA uh, matching with the virus found in humans. But as Dr. Linda Wang, a virologist at Duke National University of Singapore Medical School, who was a part of the team that found the origin of SARS virus, mentioned that even a 99% similarity between RBTs of the two viruses is not necessarily enough to link them. So the genetic similarity should be higher than the reported in these studies before the host can be identified. You know, as per uh, Dr. RNJ Banerjee, who studies coronavirus at McMaster University in uh, Hamilton, Canada. He also mentioned that the SARS virus shared 99.8% of its genome with the civet coronavirus, which is why civets were considered the source. So therefore, it is not clear yet that any bats or pangolins, live or dead, were on sale in December at the Hunan uh, or Huanan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan province, where more than half of the people first identified with the virus had shopped. And it's possible that the viral leap into humans occurred somewhere else, as some early cases occurred in people with no known link to it. We definitely need to nail down the host species because there could be a population of animals capable of spreading new outbreaks. And as uh, Dr. Melissa Nolan, an infectious disease uh, epidemiologist at the University of South Carolina noted. She said, if we don't know the intermediate host is and it's capable of transporting the infection, then we ultimately can't sp uh, stop the spread of this virus. So with the uh, coronavirus spreading rapidly around the world, some have raised concerns about whether it can pass between pets and people. So far, there have been a few reports of pets being infected. A cat in Belgium and a dog in Hong Kong. So a team of scientists experimentally introduced SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID-19 virus into the noses of five domestic cats and they found the viral RNA as well as the infectious viral particles in the upper respiratory tracts. So the cats can be infected with the coronavirus and they can spread to other cats, but you know, uh, so far there's no cat to human transmission that has been established. So the, the researchers noted that the surveillance for this virus, uh, the novel coronavirus in cats should be considered as part of the efforts to eliminate COVID-19 in humans. And in addition to this cat, uh, a 19-year-old, or, or I'm sorry, a 17-year-old Pomeranian pit dog contracted COVID-19 uh, from its owner in Hong Kong. Though it died uh, later, the veterinarians determined that the coronavirus is not the cause of its death. And also that the Chinese uh, research group observed that dogs are not really susceptible to the COVID-19 infection. So on April 17th, New York Times reported that a tiger in Bronx Zoo, New York City, had contracted coronavirus. The zoo vets later determined that a zookeeper was COVID-19 positive and probably was the source of the virus transmission. Later, four other tigers and three lions in the same zoo started exhibiting the symptoms such as dry cough, like the tiger did, and all of them tested positive for the novel coronavirus. 
And so, so far, these were the only animals that have been known to have contracted the coronavirus. So there's no direct evidence that infected cats secreted enough coronavirus to pass down to people. However, no research stray cats and dogs can carry the virus mechanically from infected people on their first to other people in the neighborhoods in the vicinity. See, that is the uh, big concern that I personally have because uh, uh, in India, we tend to you know, pet or feed stray cats and dogs. Um, you know, uh, and as I speak, uh, my colleagues in Chennai are looking into this possibility and hopefully that's not the mode of transmission. <laughs> So uh, the important points lesson learned, which may help in prevent, uh, prevention of future pandemics. So the spillover of virus happens unpredictably. It is still unclear why and how a virus normally replicates in an animal, starts to infect uh, humans. And, uh, you know, so far, no epidemic zoonotic disease in history has been predicted before the viral leap, unfortunately. So the immediate intermediate host from which the novel coronavirus was transmitted to humans still needs to be confirmed. So the new mathematical modeling, diagnostic communications and informatic technologies can perhaps identify and report either to unknown microbes in other species. And thus, new risk assessment approach, approaches are needed to identify microbes most likely to cause the human disease. So in summary, preventing and controlling future pandemic occurrences remains a global priority, and of course, containing the current one. So zoonosis is the mode of 60% uh, of emerging diseases in human. No epidemic zoonotic disease in history has been predicted before the viral leap. So it's extremely important to know the animal carrier that directly infects human. Uh, and the Rai sentence says, you know, we don't know it until we know it. So the risk assessment, assessment based on new mathematical and computational modeling may be quite helpful. So these advances in metagenomic technology have led to efforts in which molecular data are prospectively used to identify potential human pathogens in other species. So the goal of such studies is to characterize novel microbes and assess probable virulence and uh, transmissibility in people. Thank you. If you have any questions. Yeah, so so now I would call upon the audience. Uh, please put your question to Dr. Radha Krishnan. If you have any. Yes, now this is the question answer session. So if you have any question, please uh, put uh, before the uh, doctor before Dr. Radha Krishnan. Please read the question. Okay, sir, uh, this is Mr. Uh, Satish Lavate. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Yes, I can. Okay. So, from Mr. Satish Lavate, he is asking a question that why almost all the virus so far created panic are found in abroad, maybe China, Africa, etc. Uh, but hardly any virus originated from India. What is the reason? Please answer. So, this is very interesting question has been asked from Satish Lavati. Does it have any kind of geographic indication, sir, with regard to the viruses? Yeah, actually, you know, uh, yeah, as uh, we saw the, the viral jump from an animal host to uh, human beings, you know, occur uh, mostly in, you know, China, all this SARS and, you know, in, uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, because of the, their culture, I guess, it, they have this um, uh, live animal markets and uh, you know, of course, their food in, 
includes uh, you know bats snakes and uh, you know rodents and stuff so the more chances that you have in coming into contact with with the wild you know wild animal species you know the more are the chances of this um, you know virus uh, jump from the animal host to the human beings and you know that's exactly what what's happening i you know, i think but sir all the time we are the sufferers because oh, we have oh. a large population and yeah. they consider it as a business from the pharma point of view or some other way but fact of the matter is we are we are not troubling anyone anywhere uh, anyone across globe we consider as a vasudev kutumbam kutumbakam and hardly we disturb anyone but still then we have been suffered because of these uh, uncivilized or you can say some other rude practices where they eat anything and because of that we have been troubled that, that that's that is true unfortunately uh, as we saw you know the global trade you know uh, um, you know makes makes the transmission very fast as you saw um the uh, um emergence of the coronavirus pandemic or the covid-19 disease started in wuhan province in china and uh, unfortunately yes, coinciding with the chinese new year celebration so a lot of uh, european tourists uh you know uh, and american tourists went there and also the you know not the native uh, americans or the uh, hello Uh, Europeans, it's the Chinese uh, uh, people living in these countries. They also went back to their home country for these celebrations, and uh, exactly at the time of this uh, emerging disease, and they carried the virus obviously, you know, quickly to these countries back, and uh, that you know that's why we're noticing this uh, quick transmission all over the world through air travel and such. and the worst part of this virus is the you know asymptomatic carriers it is you know um when uh, the united states had only around uh, you know about 200000 cases now it's crossed a million as you know there was you know yes, of course the, the population uh, or being tested and there was a group of uh, residents in in a homeless shelter in boston so they tested about uh, 350 people there and then 164 of them tested positive but then none of the 164 people exhibited any symptoms so that 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 was the first time that 100% of the a sample of population that were positive did not have any symptoms at all so imagine you know the, the people don't know that they have the virus and it, when they go into those large crowds and uh, you know the airborne and person to person transmission is very much possible and, and that is the very reason of this lockdowns you know that uh, to mitigate the transmission yeah, yeah. Well, with regard to the with regard to this only sir uh, one very relevant question is coming from the student of school of law mohammad danish khan sure uh, he is asking whether it is possible that covid-19 could do mutation in near future and could return as even more dangerous than what it is today yeah, well unfortunately the possibility remains you know um especially as as we have seen in the other coronavirus the, the you know the flu virus and such um especially the flu virus you know they mutate even within a season and so even okay. you know persons who get flu vaccine they they you know suffer from the flu again because of the mutation i you know we really hope and pray that that doesn't happen before this uh, pandemic is contain, contained sir, but, but it's possible that you know it can come back a large population and they consider it as a business from the pharma point of view or some other way but fact of the matter is we are satish sir please please mute please mute yeah. your audio and hardly we disturb anyone but still then so, we have been suffered because so uh, so i was saying so it is you know yes yes it is continuous it, it, you know it is it 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 is possible that possibility remains that uh, you know it it, uh, it can mutate and uh, you know um come in a different uh, form i mean like a, another wave of infection okay so th- this is there is a high possibility that it can return Well, no, I don't. I don't say high possibility, but the possibility remains. But uh, but we're you know we're only hopeful that it, it doesn't happen. Okay. Okay. 
sir uh, uh next question is coming from uh <coughs> rinku kalra uh, sorry uh, satakshi singh mm. uh, she uh, so satakshi is asking it is uh, corona is found uh, it is found that corona virus attached to cell or enters the cell you said cells genetic material to replicate but not uh, with uh, nuclear genetic material why is it so so that's the mode of uh, you know uh, uh, infection of all you know rna viruses okay. so yeah so one one more question is coming here sir uh, uh, rinku kalra is asking uh, uh, mr rinku kalra is asking bats are a reservoir for the virus so can't its serum be used to make a vaccine for the humans no, actually that's a good question okay. but but you know um so the the interspecies variation you know oh will make it uh, you know almost impossible to do that um so but it, but the human you know serum of course you know, can be used though. okay so there is a lot of talk regarding sir corona virus and its existence in the various uh, weather condition and uh, uh, we have also heard in the news that it cannot survive in the hot summer like we have in india so what would you like to tell that can corona virus su- survival in this uh, survive in this se- severe summer actually yeah they uh, you know one researcher studied or our research group studied various uh, temperature and humidity uh, range in which the corona virus you know thrives and uh, or, or and become you know less uh, virulent so the hot summers where we have the hot temperature and the high humidity in perhaps can mitigate the spread because they found that uh, the temperature ranging from 80 to 90 degrees with uh, about 70% humidity the virulence of the virus decreases pretty much so you know that that's a possible in fact um, it could be a reason why the number of cases are not explosively you know increasing in uh, um you know india and other uh regions as opposed to the places um, like united states and europe where the temperatures are well below 60 degrees uh, right now so it, it is possible that you know it it can um, reduce in intensity but again you know uh, with the uh the the population density that we have prevent person to person contact uh re- regarding the vaccination of the corona virus sir would you like to add something further that uh, when we can expect the vac- vaccine can come or how much time it will it will take uh, for the vaccine effective vaccine to come out here yeah there there are you know as as you know there are so many uh, companies that are trying to make the vaccine uh, possible you know all over the world but but in fact this is the fastest period that uh, a vaccine has been you know developed uh, the vaccines are already there um, and it's in fact in the united states uh, a vaccine is being put to trial since march okay. okay um so but but you know there's a there are safety and efficacy studies just because a vaccine is created you know you don't know that it will be you know efficient in preventing the disease so we need to first look at the vaccine's eff- you know efficacy and also safety i mean it it can prevent the disease but it may produce you know highly undesirable effects so first the efficacy and st- safety studies should be completed that's why they always say it's about a year from you know when the vaccine is produced the oxford university um is having you know uh, or, or um as a vaccine that is put into trial right now and they want to um have 
No, it's, see, you don't want to like conclude that the vaccine is safe and efficient and then uh, start producing uh, enough doses for the you know, millions of people. So they want to uh, concurrently uh, uh, start production. So, and they're saying it could be uh, available later in the fall, like you know, October or November. So we'll, we'll see, that is the earliest period um, that I, I have observed that the vaccine is available. But again, it depends on whether the uh, vaccine that they are testing is efficient and uh, safe. So once the trials and testings are over, sir, how much time generally it takes uh, uh, to say that now the effective vaccine ha has come? Whether it takes years or very long time. So once the vaccine is, you know, the, the, the safety and efficacy trials are completed, of course, it's ready for you know, um, uh, use in population. So that's why you know the the production, the scaling, the production would be a challenge, uh, because in the United States alone there are about 300 million people would need vaccination, and in India it's you know 1.2 billion you know, people. So scaling of the production should be fast, and also the vaccination should be simultaneous among the population. So I think uh, we are running out of time, and we have our next speaker waiting. So we have to conclude it there. Uh, so Dr. Ajit Kaushal, you can pass on the concluding remarks. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for providing very uh, valuable insights uh, regarding the spread of coronavirus. And uh, you are a uh, best pers person uh, positioned out here. Oh, because you. we all know that the spread of cor coronavirus has come from the animal. So thank you so much, sir. It was really uh, a joy to hear you. And uh, 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 thanks for providing all the information, though it was highly technical, all these matters. But you provided in a very uh, uh, lucid language. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, and thanks for uh, uh, providing us opportunity to hear in this uh, uh, international conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Radhavishnan. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. That was a very good session, and we will look forward to talk to you again. Uh, if that is possible, and if this PPT presentation can be shared with our participants, uh, then uh, that would be great because I'm sure many of our students from <coughs> School of Medical and Applied Sciences and Pharmacy and other Allied Sciences Department would like to refer to it. Sure, absolutely. I'll, I'll send you the you know uh, updated one. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. Bye. Uh, now I would like to welcome Dr. Subhash Chauhan. Uh, Dr. Subhash. Dr. Subhash. Hello, sir. Uh, hello, Professor Dr. Subhash. Hello, Dr. Subhash. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear okay, you. Okay, yeah, I can hear you as well. How so are you? We are, I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us.